When you think of the destruction of World War I, most likely the first image would come to mind would be the trenches of the Western Front or maybe even the tragedy of Gallipoli. However, far from Europe, in 1917, a harbour in Nova Scotia, Canada saw one of the largest explosions of the war, yielding a death toll of nearly 2,000 people and flattening vast swathes of the city of Halifax, all because of two cargo ships colliding at a speed of barely two miles an hour. Halifax, for most of its history, has been the hub of commerce and trading. Ever since its founding in 1749, this was due to its large natural harbour called the Bedford Basin, allowing easy access from the Atlantic Ocean via the narrow straits. Due to the convenience of the bay, a bustling city developed under British rule. The features of the land allowed the harbour to have a well-defended entrance, and because of this, the city became the centre point for many British naval operations. The harbour had two main parts, with Halifax on the south and Dartmouth on the north. With this link to the navy, the city developed well under periods of war, as successive governments poured resources into the area's infrastructure. The port developed even further after the construction of the Intercontinental Railway and its deepwater terminal, allowing large warships to dock in 1880. The city faced economic downturn during the 1890s after Canadian factories further inland offered competition to Halifax's industries. In 1905, the British garrison left Halifax, handing over power to the Canadian authorities, eventually turning into a command post for the Royal Canadian Navy in 1910, and as such received another period of development. Halifax gained a renewed importance with the outbreak of World War I. However, due to the Royal Canadian Navy at the time having very few seaworthy ships, the Royal Navy maintained the Atlantic sea routes and once again made Halifax its North American base of operations, eventually having management return to the Canadian Royal Navy in 1915. However, the narrow strait leading into the port required ships to adhere to a strict speed limit of 5 knots, which is around 5.8 miles an hour. The ships were expected to travel on the right port side as they passed oncoming ships. Due to the risk of increasing U-boat attacks, the Royal and Canadian Royal Navies adopted the convoy system for transatlantic journeys. With the increased need for maintenance for larger amounts of ships seen at Halifax, the city saw an increase in population to 65,000. By 1917, a steady flow of troops, animals, weapons and supplies travelled through the harbour, destined for the many theatres of war. The port was protected by submarine nets, gun batteries and patrol ships during loading and unloading. Due to the importance as a military installation for the Atlantic, all neutral ships bound for North American ports had to report to Halifax for inspection before being allowed to continue on their journey. It was this requirement for inspection that would spell disaster for the people living in Halifax. The SS Emo was a cargo ship built by the Harland and Wolf Company in 1889, originally sailing under the name Runic. The ship would see many name and company changes over its life. However, in 1917 she became the Emo and was sailing as a neutral ship for the Belgian Relief Commission under the command of Captain Hacken, with a crew of 39 people. She was travelling empty to collect supplies for Belgium from New York and as mandated for all neutral ships, she arrived in Halifax on the 3rd of December 1917 for inspection and was set to be in harbour for two days while she took on fuel with a scheduled departure day of the 5th. Due to her travelling without cargo, she had to rely on her ballast to weigh the ship below the waterline to make the most of the propeller and rudder. However, this didn't happen, resulting in the ship being difficult to control. Emo was also a long and thin vessel and had a propeller on the right hand side of the ship, causing a transverse thrust basically causing her to veer off to the left and in reverse veer off to the right. Not the most ideal ship to navigate the tight passage at Halifax. The refuelling went over schedule and the Emo couldn't leave on the 5th. Instead, she was rescheduled to depart the next day. On the morning of the 6th, HMCS Arcadia signalled clearance to depart and with a pilot on board, the Emo set off at 7.30am. The ship entered the strait, breaking the speed limit in an attempt to make up the lost time for the one day delay in Halifax. Upon her journey down the strait, she encountered SS Clara sailing on the wrong side. Both ships agreed to pass each other starboard to starboard against what they should have done. The use of excessive speed and the now wrong side running from the Emo caused tugboat Stella Maris to take evasive action in order to avoid collision. 
We'll come back to the emo in a bit, but first we have to talk about the other major player in our story, the SS Mont Blanc. Built in 1899 by Sir Ralton Dixon and Co in Middlesbrough, the Mont Blanc was initially purchased by the Société Générale de Transport Maritime. She changed several companies still under the French flag, eventually being purchased in 1915 by the Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, French state-owned company in charge of the country's cargo operations. In 1917, she had been chartered to carry some explosives for the wartime effort, from New York to France via Halifax. The Mont Blanc's crew were intending to reach Halifax in time to be part of a convoy amassing in the basin. However, she had reached the harbour on the 5th, after the submarine nets had gone up for the night stopping access to the port. In the evening, experienced harbour pilot Francis Mackey boarded the Mont Blanc and requested special arrangements for her entry to the harbour in the form of an escort ship, but none were given. At 7.30am on the 6th, Mont Blanc was cleared for entry to the harbour as the submarine nets had been lowered. Travelling on the correct Dartmouth side of the strait, Mackey spotted the Emo at a distance of around three quarters of a mile travelling a trajectory that would cause a potential collision. Worried Mackey blew one short blast of the ship's communication whistle to indicate that Mont Blanc had the right of way. In return, Emo replied with two blasts of her whistle, indicating that she would not yield. The Mont Blanc halted her engines and turned towards the Dartmouth side of the Narrows. Once again, Mackey blew the whistle and back again came Emo's two blasts, indicating she would not yield again. Emo also cut her engines, but a collision was inevitable. Mackey feared grounding the Mont Blanc due to the risk of setting off her explosive cargo and in a last ditch effort steered to port to avoid collision. This caused both ships to be parallel to one another. At the same moment, Emo blew three times on her whistle, indicating that she was reversing her propeller. But her height in the water, caused by her lack of cargo and a transverse thrust of her offset propeller, swung her into the Mont Blanc hitting her number one hold at 8.45am. Not much damage had been physically inflicted on the Mont Blanc, but her deadly cargo of benzol had been disturbed, causing vapours to be released. Sparks from the collision caused the vapours to ignite, creating a fire on board. The fire quickly spread and became uncontrollable. Worried of the risk of explosion, the captain ordered an abandoned ship. By this time, crowds had begun to line the shore watching the spectacle. Warning shouts from the abandoned crew from their lifeboats could not be heard over the noise. Eventually, the Mont Blanc drifted and beached next to Pier 6 at the end of Richmond Street. Stella Maris was dispatched to try and fight the fire, but her single hose wasn't enough to quell the flames. HMS Flyer and HMCS Noble sent boats to attempt to use a line to drag the Mont Blanc free of the pier, but it was too late. At 9.04am, the fire set off the explosives inside the Mont Blanc. The explosion completely blew apart the ship, releasing white hot shards of iron into Halifax and Dartmouth. The explosion reached a temperature of 5000 degrees centigrade and released a shock wave of 1000 meters per second. The column of smoke rose nearly 12,000 feet into the air and the shock wave was felt as far away as 129 miles. Over 400 acres was destroyed and the floor of the harbour became visible as the explosion displaced water. As the water rushed back into the harbour, an 18 metre high tsunami was formed and raced towards the Halifax side of the harbour. The Emo was carried to the Dartmouth side by the water where she became beached. The Mont Blanc's 90mm gun landed 3.5 miles away to the north and part of her anchor weighing half a tonne landed 2 miles to the south. 21 of the 26 men aboard the Stella Maris and nearly all the men on board the two boats dispatched to attach a line were killed. All but one of the fleeing Mont Blanc crew survived but the death toll wouldn't end there. Every building within 1.6 miles of the blast, especially in the suburb of Richmond, were destroyed, killing 1,600 people instantly, injuring thousands more, 300 of which would later die from their wounds. Many people were blinded as they had watched the fire from their windows, as the explosion shattered the glass in front of their faces. Multiple fires ignited throughout Halifax as stoves were knocked over by the blast. Many were caught inside as whole blocks were set ablaze. Several factories near Pier 6 were disintegrated, killing their workers instantly. Vast waves of the city were flattened, making them almost unrecognisable. The railway yards at Richmond were destroyed, damaging 500 railway cars. 
Patrick Vincent Coleman stayed behind at his post as a railway dispatcher 750 feet away from Pier 6. After finding out about the fire aboard the Mont Blanc, to send urgent telegraph messages to an incoming passenger train. His actions saved the lives of those aboard. Sadly, Coleman was killed in the explosion. Surviving police and firefighters initially started the rescue effort. Eventually, soldiers and volunteers began to help with any surviving vehicles being used to carry the dead and wounded. Trains of relieving firefighters came in from as far as 200 miles away. Many of the Royal Navy ships in the harbour sent parties ashore to help with the rescue efforts. Although most of the damage was seen on the Halifax side, around 100 people were killed on the Dartmouth side and several buildings suffered damage, however it was slightly protected from the blast by the large size of the harbour. Troops from the harbour's fortifications were sent to the city to offer help. Rescue trains were dispatched from the rest of Canada and parts of the US. Many were made homeless and an estimated cost of $569 million worth of damage was caused in today's money. It took several years for Halifax to completely rebuild, however due to the war effort the harbour continued to be used with its first convoy departing on the 11th of December and dockyard operations resuming soon after. Many of the damaged piers were repaired and rail services resumed on the 9th after track clearance was completed. The suburb of Richmond had seen the brunt of the destruction was completely rebuilt. Being a mainly working class area it lacked proper infrastructure pre-explosion. Because of this, the destruction was seen as an opportunity to modernise the area, with the first new homes finding new residents in 1919. An investigation was launched, as initially it was thought to have been an attack by the Germans, which was understandable due to the war that was going on. The fear that it was a German attack resulted in the helmsman John Johansson of the Emo being arrested under suspicion of espionage due to him having a letter on his person thought to be written in German. However, it turned out to be written in Norwegian. Any German citizens in Halifax were rounded up and imprisoned. The rumours were pushed on by the Halifax Herald, even though there's very little evidence to prove this. Eventually the German theory dissipated as eyewitness reports became available, and an inquest was set up, working under the name of the Wreck Commissioner's Inquiry. The investigation began in Halifax Courthouse on the 13th of December 1917, presided over by Justice Arthur Drysdale. On the 4th of February 1918, the inquiry found three men at fault for the collision and resulting explosion. The Mont Blanc's captain, Ami Lemadec, the ship's pilot, Francis Mackey, and Commander Evan Wyatt, the Royal Canadian Navy's chief examining officer in charge of the harbour. The inquiry stated that it was the Mont Blanc's sole responsibility to ensure she avoided collision due to her dangerous cargo. An odd decision as the Emo was travelling too fast but it is suggested that the large anti-French public opinion influenced the inquest's findings. The three men were charged with criminal negligence and manslaughter. However, Benjamin Russell of the Nova Scotia Supreme Court overturned the charges due to lack of evidence. Both Medic and Mackey were discharged, but Wyatt went on to a grand jury hearing, where he himself was acquitted in a trial that lasted less than a day. In civil hearings for the claims of damages for both ships, initially ordered Mont Blanc to be at fault, but again the findings were overturned and found both ships were equally to blame. After all of the legal fighting, not a single person was convicted or fined for the Halifax explosion. This video was brought to you by my patrons. If you'd like to support the channel, you can from as little as $1 a month. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, if you did help the channel by subscribing, liking, sharing and if you have a video suggestion let me know in the comments. If you'd like to keep up to date with all new videos click the bell icon and all that's left to say is thank you for watching.